I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and I am very excited to be joined by Steve Sasse. Steve is the regional director for Data Center Hawk in Latin America. Steve, we're very glad you're here. Thanks for uh, joining. Great. Thanks, David. I'm very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to answering some questions and building out Latin America for Data Center Hawk. Well, um, and so are we, because, you know, there's a lot happening in the Latin America data center market. You have obviously been um, in that world for a long time. And so for those, and, and first of all, if you're watching, we just did uh, our Q1 2023 overview with Steve just this past week. And so if you want additional um, data on like the market as a whole, you can watch that. But this is the in-depth Steve version of uh, uh, Latin America. And so we're really excited to dive in, but talk about your background and, um, and how you, you know, what led you to kind of becoming uh, an expert on the Latin America market. Sure. It's funny you mentioned expert. That's a funny word. Uh, my, my team- It's a at, true word. <laughs> no, it's just funny because my team at Equinix used to call me, uh, they used to kid around because for whatever reason, a long time, uh, four or five years ago, the Mexican a Mexican journalist put El Experto in in, in one of my quotes. So that was my, that was my it? nickname at Equinix with my team was El Experto. But uh, it, it was a joke on, from from that side. But we can we can just carry it over to DC. <laughs> so El Experto, I love it. Um, so my background started way back when in the telecom industry in the UUNet, MCI, WorldCom days, uh, not data center related, but more IP transfer related, connectivity related. So a lot of that transits, you know, the data center world, I think, as you know, David, very well, you know, it's probably something that's been around 15, 20 years, 15 years, let's say, you know, in the mainstream. So at the time, there weren't many data centers. There were some telco data centers, but there weren't many third party data center providers. Um, but what happened was I, I was in the connectivity business with MCI and Verizon, and I was selling a lot of circuits, you know, a lot of uh, Ethernet circuits, a lot of uh, MPLS circuits. And what, what was happening is a lot of the circuits were terminating, terminating to data centers. And especially because I've been always focused in Latin America, um, those, uh, those circuits were terminating to the NAP of the Americas here in Miami, which is MI, Equinix MI1. At the time, it was Terramark NAP of the Americas. Uh, Verizon then purchased, uh, you know, Terramark. So, so what I decided to do is I was like, you know what, this, this data center industry or business looks pretty interesting. Uh, I transitioned internally at Verizon from Verizon selling circuits to Terramark and I started selling racks at Terramark, right? So at the time, Terramark was pretty entrenched in Latin America. I mean, obviously not in today's terms, but at the time, Terramark had a data center in Bogota, they had a data center in, in Sao Paulo, and they had the NAP of the Americas, which is here in Miami. And, and the NAP is, and as many of us know, Miami, is, there's a saying here in Miami, NAP, Miami is the closest city to the United States, because it's a lot of people don't consider Miami part of the United States, they consider more part of Latin America. Sure. Um, so, so Miami has, uh, the NAP of the Americas, I would say half of that of the data centers is, is Latin American carriers. Yep. Um, so, so obviously there was a lot involved with, with that facility and, and selling racks to, to the carriers. Um, so that's how, it, you know, that's how I got involved with, with Terramark, but then, but then Equinix came calling because Equinix was at the time that they were very limited in, in region. They weren't in Latin America. And they decided to to see what you know, maybe dip their little toe into Latin America and see what what they could do. They had a joint venture in Brazil. They they had a 50-50 joint venture with with uh, Alog and Riverwood Partners. And they decided to say, they brought me over to see, hey Steve, let's see what you can do. We're looking to grow in the region in the future, but for now, let's see how you can help out our Brazil team. How you can sell maybe some some space in Dallas or Miami or Los Angeles to some Mexican uh, and Latin American customers. So that's what I started doing for them. Uh, and yeah, it, it actually became, um, we were pretty successful, especially in, in Dallas, for example, at the Infomart. A lot of Mexican uh, carriers were buying Colo in Dallas for to, to inter, inter exchange traffic. So, so that was pretty successful. And then in Miami, uh, the Napa of the Americas as well, we were able to sell quite a bit in Los Angeles. Uh, but, then, but then Equinix started uh, going a little bit deeper into the, into the region. They bought the other 50% of, of the Brazil entity, so it became 100% Equinix. 
uh, with with the Verizon acquisitions, they purchased, they, they got, uh, they entered the Colombian market. So they got Bogota and BG1, and as well another another data center in Sao Paulo. So, you know, that that's, that they started heading a little bit more into the market. And then after that, uh, they, they bought Axtel in Mexico. So they bought three data centers in Mexico, two of them in Cretero, one in Monterey. So I assisted Equinix in, in, that, in that integration and in, in the sales process. And, you know, and also I consulted them along the way to try, try to help them expand the region. After Equinix, I moved over uh, to Kio Data Centers, which is Kio, for the people who don't know Kio, Kio is probably the largest data center provider in Mexico. And um, they're very entrenched in the market. They have a pretty large ecosystem in Mexico. But Kio uh, is, is very Mexican, right? They, they don't know uh, markets outside of Mexico and Central America. So they hired me to try to expand their footprint outside of, of Central America and Mexico. So with Kio, I was able to um, find them a data center in Bogota. And, and literally the, my last day at Kio, before I came over to Data Center Hawk, uh, we signed the deal to, for, the, for Kio's data center in, in Bogota. So uh, that's, that's pretty much my, my experience for the last 10, 12 years. Sure. And it's, you know, what I like about, like about your background is the depth of uh, expertise you have in Latin America as a whole, different places, uh, different cities within uh, the region. And uh, you've really been on the front lines. It's something that I, I take a lot of pride in, you know, as I think about like getting into the space back in 2007 um, and a bit blindly, you know, just jumping in and not really knowing where the market was and, and quickly realizing, hey, this is a very young industry um, and we've been able to see it, you know, grow. What do you think are some of when you think about Latin America, what are some of the aspects um, that make it different than other regions? Yeah, so so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, Latin America is a little bit different than, than the rest of the world. You need to adapt to the markets. You need to to figure out. Every, obviously, there's you know ex, so many countries in Latin America. They all have different laws, different regulations. But I think that's something that's that's very common in the region uh, that that companies need to at least uh, work with and adapt is number one is inflation, right? Inflation and we. We've seen global inflation uh, the last year or two, you know, that we, numbers that we haven't seen in a long time in the United States. But in some of these markets, that's pretty standard. Uh, you know, the inflation ranges anywhere from from three or four percent, five percent, all the way up to Argentina, I think, had 100 percent inflation uh, or Q1. So you, you need to adapt to the inflation and that could be mitigated by by, you know, putting some price increases into your contracts. Right. So a lot of the providers put price increases Every year it goes up uh, the COLA, which is the cost of living adjustment percentages. The other thing uh, you know, people need to also be aware of is the current currency devaluation. So some markets uh, lost, for example, last year, I think Bogota had a 16% devaluation versus the US dollar. You know, so what, if you all your contracts are in Colombian pesos, then you know, you've lost some money there. So you, you address that by doing your contracts in U.S. dollars, so, you know, mm. where you can. Now, now, that's not possible in every market, but where you can, you, you do it in U.S. dollars. I think another, another uh, aspect of the Latin region that people don't realize is that, is that there's very little intra-regional connectivity. And what, what do I mean by that? So uh, Brazil and Chile were probably the first markets to have hyperscaler cloud nodes in those markets, right? So you think, okay, I'm in Argentina, I should be able to tap into those cloud nodes with low latency. It doesn't work that way because uh, the way that the fiber was built out in the region, I would say 98 to 99% of the traffic from Argentina will flow north uh, to usually to Miami and in Chile, the other way, also the other way to Los Angeles. So the fiber in between countries, and, and it, it's for different reasons, uh, regulations, sure. geography, you know, to cross from Argentina to Chile, you have to cross the Andes. To go to Brazil, you have to, there's, uh, there's a, all these different variations why you might not put a lot of interregional um, fiber. So, so what that means is that, for example, if it, until four or five years ago, if you sent an email from Argentina to Brazil, that email would travel all the way to Miami and then from Miami to Brazil. 
So that implies high latency, right? Uh, a latency, a normal latency between Buenos Aires and Ashburn, which is at the right now probably the closest cloud that they connect connect to, is four to five hundred milliseconds. You know, many applications won't work with four or five hundred milliseconds. Sure. So this is why you're what you're seeing today is the hyperscalers are, are looking to do regional, uh, either local zones yeah. or, or local cloud nodes. Um, the other, other and actually, actually, let me interrupt. That's a really good point because you know if you think about like things in the U.S., very different as it relates to you know the connectivity story and how you know hyperscale or data center providers you know will link their sites together. And this is you know as you as we as you look at international growth, one of the reasons these different markets have been able to grow significantly is because. The re- some of the regulatory challenges as well as um, the infrastructure challenges that are there. And so it really forces sometimes groups to take bigger footprints or it can create longer timelines because of the either lack of infrastructure or the maturing infrastructure that's needed to make the applications work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another, another I guess, uh, aspect of the region that people don't really realize is there's not a lot of secondary markets in the region. Um, I think in the U.S., as we all know, and in, and in Europe, there's secondary markets, right? Obviously, the, the big, I would, in the past, used to be called the NFL cities and then the other sure. secondary markets. Yep. In Latin America, uh, the majority of the population, most of them live in, in the capital city or, or their largest metropolitan areas. So you don't get a lot of secondary markets. There are secondary markets, obviously, Rio, um, in Mexico, Guadalajara, Monterey, but but for the most part, the primary markets are, are the largest population areas, and and you don't get a lot of data center density outside of those larger markets, right? So so I, I would say there is a slight there there is a, a secondary market in in some countries, and that's more related to submarine cable capacity and cable landings. So, if, for example, in Rio de Janeiro, in in Brazil, in Fortaleza, in Brazil, in uh, uh, where else? In um, Barranquilla, in, in Colombia, that's where a lot of the submarine cables are, are hitting. Uh, you know those countries. So, some providers, what what they'll do is they'll build a data center. Usually, it has to be less than a mile from the ocean, and they'll put the the cable landing station inside the data center, the, the, the CLS station inside there. So, so then they don't have to build a separate landing station. And then they can, they can interconnect inside that that facility, but that that that's not the norm. I mean, the norm I think is for the most of these countries. You'll see that the data center density is around their largest metropolitan areas, and and you know I think one one other I think big aspect, and this is the underdeveloped uh, digital infrastructure in, in the region, is if you take the if you look at the U.S. The U.S. today, for example, per one million. Uh, in population, they have the equivalent of 30 megawatts of capacity, right? In the UK, nine megawatts of capacity. In Chile, it drops down to five megawatts of capacity. In Brazil, 1.7 megawatts. In Mexico, 1.1, and in Colombia, one megawatt. So that tells you the disparity between US, UK versus some of these Latin countries and, and what they need to build. Absolutely. Well, and let's talk about some of the main markets uh, there in Latin America. And just maybe you give us off the top of your head, just maybe a quick little update on, you know, each one. If you're, let's start with Mexico. Maybe what are the major markets there and and what do you think at a high level is happening? So Mexico uh, is the, the major, I guess, the hotbed right now for data center construction and, and build out is in Querétaro. Uh, it's a hard word for a lot of people to say, but it is, <laughs> it's Querétaro. Uh, Creator is sort of becoming the new Ashburn, uh, I would say, if you compare it to the U.S. You know, Ashburn, I, I, I worked in Ashburn a long time ago, and I sure. remember Ashburn where there was just cow fields and a- right. AOL and UUNED, and yeah. I wish I had bought some land at the time, but... Uh, <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Um, but Creator is becoming the Mexican Ashburn, I would say, or Silicon Valley. So, you know, Creator is, 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 is about 120 miles north of, of Mexico City. And what makes Cretero very interesting is all the fiber, and, and this is the difference between the fiber between Mexico and the way the fiber works for the rest of the region. All the fiber connectivity from Mexico goes from Mexico City North, goes via Cretero, via Monterey, and then up to Dallas, right? Hmm. Very little fiber goes south. 
The rest of the region is the one they're using the, the submarine cables and the connectivity that goes either via to LA, Miami, New York. So Mexico is, is all terrestrial fiber for the most part. And, and the connectivity goes Mexico City, Cretero. And so that, that's an important factor about, about Cretero. Um, you know, there's available land. Um, Cretero is very different than Mexico City. Cretero is, is solid rock, Mexico City. This, the, the city itself, the downtown, not all of Mexico City, but the downtown part of Mexico City was built on a dried lake bed. So that's why, you know, unfortunately, when you have these earthquakes in Mexico City, there's a lot of movement. And a lot of these, you know, obviously, we, data centers don't want to be in, in, that, sure. in that region. Outside of Mexico City, in an area called Santa Fe, which is a little bit further, a little bit higher up on, on the side of, mount, of, of a mountain, uh, that's a little bit, there, there's, they have less seismic activity there. So there are some good data centers there, but Querétaro is far enough from, from Mexico City where they're not impacted by, by the earthquakes. Uh, and in Mexico City, obviously, it's, it's the largest city in Latin America as far as metropo you know, metropolitan areas. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of investment going on to Mexico City. Um, there's a lot of um, what they call unicorns, so a lot of startups. Even U.S. companies are going into, uh, U.S. entrepreneurs are actually going to Mexico because there's access to high-tech uh, uh, people that are highly trained in, in, in technology and, and the costs are lower. So a lot of companies are sure. starting their companies in Mexico, the unicorn companies, uh, and that obviously leads to digital infrastructure and, and data centers, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the next market to talk about is Bogota. Bogota right now has basically an install capacity, I would say anywhere from 40 to 50 megawatts. But it's forecasted to have you know another 250 to 300 megawatts in the next few years. Um, so there's a large capacity there to, for growth. Mexico, Colombia is an interesting country because the energy, 75% uh, of the energy in Colombia comes from hydroelectric production. So it, it is a very green country. Their energy is is for the most. I mean they obviously they have oil obviously, but but uh, uh, they there's there's access to green energy in Colombia for the data center providers if they so choose to to use okay. it. Um, well, the, the sort of the, the elephant in the room in Latin America, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the biggest market. The state of Sao Paulo. If you just take this, the, there's a city of Sao Paulo and the state of Sao Paulo. So it's like New, like New York City and and the sure. state of New York, right? The state of Sao Paulo is, is take, makes up about forty percent of the Latin American economy. So it's it's a huge economic power. Um, the country of, of Sao Paulo, um, I'm sorry, the country of Brazil it last year became the 10th largest country by GDP, you know, in the world. So they've surpassed countries like South Korea, Russia, Australia. You know, so Brazil is, is, is kind of a sleeping giant when it comes to digital infrastructure. They, 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 are, they require data centers and they, they are way ahead of, of the rest of the region. So I think Sao Paulo will continue to grow and there's going to be continued uh, hyperscale activity in those markets, in that market. Then Santiago is sort of like the, the, the it is a smaller market than, than the ones I just mentioned, but it's a more developed market. It's a more mature market. So in all of these markets, the, the, uh, the digital infrastructure uh, has, has been built up at different, different levels. But IT outsourcing, right? Some some have experienced IT outsourcing. Chile was the first one to experience IT outsourcing, probably about five or ten years ago. So the data center market has grown because of that, right? And the hyperscalers have put nodes in Santiago because, as I mentioned earlier, Argentina has a 400, 450, 400 to five hundred millisecond latency. Chile, who's on the western side of South America has an even further uh, distance to travel to, to the US and, and to some of the cloud nodes. So um, Google was the first one to put a, a pretty large facility there, a cloud node with 80 megawatts, and, and the rest followed, right? So, so they're, they're much more uh, mature and much further ahead than some of these other countries when it comes to uh, data centers and, and uh, you know, uh, cloud capacity. And I think that's it, those are the five markets. So with you, so we just talked about kind of the present state of the major markets there in Latin America. What do you think are trends you'll see in future years in this region? 
Yeah, well, I, I think the, the biggest trend is, like I mentioned, the, the underdeveloped uh, digital infrastructure. The, it's forecasted that there's going to be a 6x in megawatt growth in the next 10 years, right? So take today's commission capacity and multiply that by, by 6x. Um, the hyperscaler grows, as I mentioned, they're expanding into other markets. So like I mentioned, they're in, in Brazil, they're in Chile. Uh, not, right now, they're expanding into Mexico. They're going to be expanding into Colombia and probably other markets after that. Um, so it's forecasted that the hyperscaler is going to spend. Right, I'm sorry, it's forecasted that the hyperscaler is going to uh, have an, at least 500 megawatts each of of growth in the next 10 years. Um, um, you know, the recent adoption of public cloud, mobile connectivity. And internet access is also is 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 sort of accelerating the requirements for the, for the digital infrastructure, and and I think one important point that people don't realize is there's a lot of what's called nearshoring in Latin America, and nearshoring is when companies move their their operations from one country to the other in order to get closer to the end user, right? And what's happening is, is and for various reasons, for you know, cheaper labor force, uh, reduced sure. cost, be better access to, to a market. In, in Mexico, for example, you know, we, know, we all know what happened with the supply chain and, and COVID, right? And, and we couldn't get the, the goods from, from Asia into the, into the US or other markets because delays, you know, it takes a long time to ship that from, from Asia. So a lot of Chinese companies have set up shop in northern Mexico, right, in um, north of Monterey. So uh, a lot of these, there's been two to anywhere from two to four hundred million dollars of investment from some of these Chinese companies building out factories there in order to access the U.S. So that that will pretty soon you're going to see instead of made in China, you're going to see made in Nuevo León, right? Because uh, a lot of this is being manufactured in, in, in Mexico. Tesla just announced a, a pretty large factory you know, in Monterey. So Tesla is going to be making cars uh, in Mexico as well. What that means is a lot of this, uh, but you know, uh, investment in the region from these companies, uh, that, you know, that are going to be operating in Mexico, are going to require uh, digital infrastructure, and, and that means in turn data centers. Sure. Well, Steve, this is. Uh you know, really interesting to hear how the market is changing. Uh, you know, I think you you brought up just the six six times growth that you know is anticipated in this market over the next. You know, I think it was is it ten years that six times growth. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot that's going to happen. I think here in these areas, and so for us, really exciting that you're you've joined uh, our team. You're building out our Latin America, um, you know, practice. And uh, very fun to see uh, what's going to happen in the future. So thanks again for sharing the thoughts. Um, you know, if people want to connect with you, they can get on datacenterhawk.com, um, find your information there. And uh, we look forward to catching up uh, on the next one here about Latin America. Great. Thank you. Look forward to it.